Okay. Thank you, Jerry. And good evening and welcome to this Wild Ones Rock River Valley chapter presentation. Our speaker tonight comes to us from Illinois Extension. Peggy Doty is an educator for University of Illinois Extension, specializing in environmental education as a means to relate wildlife issues and water quality to all ages. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Zoology with a specialization in wildlife management. Peggy is interested in human interactions and relationships to wildlife, especially in regards to the large predators, and now she's studying feral swine in Illinois. She also holds a master's degree in education with a specialization in outdoor teacher education, curriculum, and instruction. Peggy's been teaching environmental education for over 20 years. She's passionate about teaching children in regards to their environment and helping people of all ages to understand wildlife as it relates to their lives. Peggy was last with us a year ago in March of 2021 when she did a program about the woodpeckers of Illinois, which you can view on our website under meetings for 2021. So tonight, Peggy is going to speak to us about those mysterious birds of the night, Illinois owls, masters of illusion and silence. Peggy. Hi everybody, I left my video on just long enough so you can put a, a face to the to the sound coming out. Um, thank you, that was that was a very, it's always hard to listen to who you are, you know, it's like, yeah, but really I just work at a nature center in Genoa. It's called the Natural Resource Education Center and I am with U of I Extension, but I partner with DeKalb County Forest Preserve and DeKalb County Soil and Water. So I am the entire environmental education staff right here tonight with you for all three entities. Um, and I would like to share, we are having a, um, a soft opening with a large program on Saturday. So after, after Saturday, the hopefully I will have some volunteers um, working on getting the building open for company. We've been closed because I'm the only one here and I can't, I can't clean after someone's been here for the next people um, because I have another full-time job. So um, we are located in Russell Woods Forest Preserve, which is one mile west of Genoa on Route 72. All you have to do is look for the Genoa Kingston High School because they built it right on our entrance road. It's a huge landmark and just come all the way to the very end. Uh, we are getting a brand new bridge that is going to be fully accessible and it's almost done. It's been quite the quite the ordeal and I'd love to I'd love to have you visit. And if you do, make sure you tell me that you were on tonight and and uh, we can look around and I can uh, show you where things happen here in Russell Woods. So I'm going to turn my video off just so that I don't take up more bandwidth than I already am. And we'll go through this presentation isn't huge. And I have to say from the beginning, I am not an owl specialist. Um, I do love them. I, after my first degree, my bachelor's degree from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, uh, I did an apprenticeship at Land Between the Lakes where I really wanted to work on the Osprey program as a wildlife biologist. I wasn't really thinking I wanted to talk to people. And they put me at the nature center and I got to work with three owls and many other animals. But you know, it's one of those situations where in your apprenticeship, you learn more than you ever did in the four years you were studying. And I grew to have a passion for these very, you know, lumbering beasts of the night. And uh, I will, I will share some stories as we go along. This actually was my presentation slide on the front for our envir Everyday Environments webinars. Um, U of I Extension does one a month now. We were doing one a, one a week, but I love this, this slide set. So I kept that one in there for you. So we'll get going. Hey, yeah. Hey, uh, hold on a second. Um, is anyone else having trouble hearing? Oh, is I can hear fine. Somebody... I've got a microphone. I will try to move it closer and see if that helps us a little bit. Paul, you might just turn up your, uh, see if you can turn up the volume on your computer. I think mine's kind of maxed out, but. Sounds good to me. How's that? Does that help? I put it a little, the, the microphone just a little closer. <coughs> and I'll try to. I'll try to talk louder. There's nobody here that I will annoy. So minus the animals. So I'll try to speak up. All right. So we'll go through. And uh, again, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll stay as long as necessary to answer um, uh, what I know uh, about them. And we'll 
Oop, there we go. So trying to be clever, you know, is who do we know in Illinois? And we have a, a short list, actually. We don't have, you'll find that I am, um, I wouldn't say a lazy learner. I like to check off the boxes. So woodpeckers, you can learn all the woodpeckers. <clears throat> if you haven't seen that recording that we did a year ago, you can learn them all in the hour and be done with woodpeckers. Tonight, you can learn all the owls that tend to live or visit Illinois in this next presentation. So I like being able to check off chunks. And this is another one of those wildlife chunks we, we check off. So check this out. Of the 19 owl species in North America, we have four all of the time throughout Illinois and four tend to be down in the winter more. Um, <clears throat> the order, if you remember all of your science, the Strigiformes, there's two families. The barn owl, which is my absolute favorite, and I'll tell you why later. The barn owl, uh, ours was called Tito after the Tenotidae, which is a Greek word meaning night owl, which is, of course, there, you know, that makes sense, right? To finally have something named that makes sense. Um, while the other, the others are in the Strigidae. So there is a, um, there is a small, just the barn owl in one of those orders. And then the others, I'm going to move my bar out of the way here. It's in my way. There we go. I couldn't see all the list of my owls. Um, the numbers are an average, uh, from many sources. So this is to show you, you know, the general size. So these sizes are body length by wind, by wing width. So, the tall, how tall are they, is the first number. I've, I've put these in order of largest to smallest. And then the wingspan is the second number. You know, generally with birds, the larger, the longer they may live. Um, that tends to be true um, from hummingbirds to condors. And the same, same tends to be the for these guys. So our fab four are the ones that are highlighted, the ones that are here all the time. We have the great horned owl. Uh, who is on, on, actually they're on fledglings. The great horned owl, owlets are almost ready to branch right now. They start in February. And I don't know if that was a natural selection thing, but if you think about, you're the largest bird of prey, you hunt at night, you're slow, and you want to get a jump start on the night, the night eaters, right? Because you're competing with uh, mammals that eat uh, things you eat, and you're going to compete with other owls once those are, once those are, uh, uh, hatched and in, in the nest. So great horns are on nest in February. So now the, the owlets are not quite as big as their parents, but they're goofy looking. They're big fluff balls, but they're starting to get their, their feathers and they will be branching another, basically that's a word for fledging when you're ginormous. Um, so that's going to happen really soon. These high winds have been making me very nervous because I have two uh, great horned owl nests that I'm watching and I'm scared to death. They're not, they're going to, they're going to skip branching and get thrown right to the ground uh, before they're ready. So the barred owl, that second one is your teddy bear owl, the one that does the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Uh, I learned that in Kentucky and will never get that out of my head. And then the barn owl, one of our endangered owls who, uh, due to habitat loss, and we'll talk about that, they're the monkey faced or the heart shaped owl, the white one, very um, mysterious and ghost looking at night. And if you skip down to the second from the bottom, the eastern screech owl, those are our fab four that are here all the time. And the others tend to come in and out depending on weather, habitat needs, um, and they're not as common as the others. So what do we know? And this is kind of a, a, a lengthy slide, but the bullet points are the individual, individual information pieces. Uh, males and females almost always have similar plumage, um, except for the snowy. The female is much more speckled. They're nesting on the ground and they, they need that camouflage. So if you see a very white, white snowy owl, chances are you're looking at a male. The females tend to stay more mottled. Females are always birds of prey, whether it's falcons or hawks or eagles or owls, the females are a third larger than the males. And that holds true for all those, for all those species. And that's probably because in some cases, so the great horned owl male, he's feeding his significant other all the time, but not necessarily the bards don't do that. So we've got these bigger females able to uh, burn up a little more weight if need be while they're sitting on eggs. The, the male great horn is actually quite helpful and will sometimes even sit on the nest, but that's not true for everybody. 
they're at the top of their food chain as predators. Um, they're very territorial, will kill each other. A great horned owl will fly right over the top of a barred owl in his, to in her, his or her territory and literally just snap their neck off, just pop their heads right off as they fly over. They're extremely territorial and that's not helpful clearly to the population of barred owls. Nocturnal by nature, but they can hunt during the day. They're just, they're slow in flight. So nighttime gives them that additional support and we'll talk about other tools in their toolbox. Um, so they're not, it's, it's, it's not wrong. As a matter of fact, barred owls actually really enjoy hunting during the day. And that might be a pressure thing because the next biggest one is your great horned owl. So why compete at night if you can hunt? And they actually love crayfish. So when you're looking for barred owls, look around creek beds, you know, and look at the trees kind of low in the trees or on signposts by a river crossing. Um, they do like the shallow muddy areas because they actually have a taste for crayfish. Uh, important ecological service. Clearly they help our rodent population to decrease that for, our, for the sake of the lower part of the food chain to keep it in check. And each species has multiple calls. Um, the, the, the exception I found was the barred owl um, who just keeps calling the same sound um, almost always. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, well, I added a note over here, Hedwig, Harry Potter's female owl was played by a male snowy owl. Um, if you look at him and it was heavily, uh, the females have the heavily barred and, and he wasn't and barred owls. I noted lose up to 30% of their body weight when they're brooding the females, because the, the male stays away and that might be to protect that nest and to protect his female, but it doesn't always work out well weight wise for her. Um, and you don't often have screech owls where there's barred owls, same reason, territorial, um, barred owls will eat screech owls. So if you have a screech owl, you may not have a barred owl nearby. So I like to look at all wildlife as having a toolkit. And in that toolkit, they have things they absolutely need. And if, if they lose one or more pieces of their toolkit, their percent of percent chance of survival reduces quite quickly. If we go to the mammal world and we look at the cougars, because I have um, a high interest in large predators, which by the way, this is the time of year, the females have kicked out the cougar youth, the young males and the young male black bears are now kicked out. So they're out wandering around, not gonna be a surprise if you if you hear of or spot something like that, they're wandering through. Um, but if a, if a cougar loses one claw, they reduce their life expectancy by 60%. They're just, they're, the chance of survival drops by 40%. And that's just one. Um, I can't imagine what it would be with one canine and one claw. So these, these toolboxes are really important. And if you look at this list, <clears throat> I won't read them all to you because they're short, but these are all things that owls have in their toolbox. And we're gonna talk about some parts and pieces that will relate to these uh, kind of these metaphors that I've put on here. Um, Lack, lack of garbage disposal. So that last one is because as many of you know, birds of prey will cough up pellets, not just owls, but all of them. When they get too much fur, feather, and bone that can't be digested, they basically hack up a, it's like a cat with a fur ball. It just happens to be um, a pellet full of bones and mischief. So that's the one tool they don't have, but they have an adaptation. They, they can throw it up. And owls can turn their head over 250 degrees. Um, there was some things I found where people used to believe that they were owned by witches when they were first discovered and they spun them what looked like they spun their head around, but it's really an illusion. And it's because their eyes don't move. Their eyes, the muscles in their eyes are so large, they have to, to swivel their head to see things. They can't just move their eyeballs around. Um, you can't see me right now, but I'm moving my eyeballs around, right? Because I'm talking and doing what I'm saying. And then the gizzard holds, and um, the gizzard is what holds everything and makes up the pellet before it gets thrown back up at the world. All right, so great horned owls. Uh, this They're considered a species in decline based on forest habitat. That is not in every single part of Illinois, but I know there was some concern in Southern Illinois. Um, they're considered common and not threatened yet. And like I said, earliest nesters, they start talking to each other in November. They're on the nest in February. Now here's something that just happened this year. The pair in my neighborhood never stopped talking. They're, they go silent in February. They went silent last year and the year before, but this year they kept calling to each other and I thought they failed to lay eggs. I thought they failed to reproduce. So I'm like, oh, they're just gonna keep talking all, all season. 
Well, we have at least one owlet. So they've just broken the rules. And what I tell my master naturalist, because I do train um, master naturalists, I facilitate that training. And I always ask, tell them that when you're looking at birds, no matter what they're doing, if the bird says one thing and the book says another, please believe the bird because the birds write the books. It's just nobody was listening or paying attention and finding those idiosyncrasies. So um, the adults are like two and a half to three and a quarter pounds. They eat the larger prey. They're, they actually like skunk because of its size. They kind of skunks are a little slow and that should tell you that they don't have a developed olfactory lobe which is the sense of smell. So if somebody brings me a box and says, hey, I've got this injured owl, I don't know what to do. I recommend it go into the rehabber, of course, but I smell the box. And they'll say, what are you smelling? I said, I'm smelling for skunk because if I smell skunk, I know exactly which bird it is, which species, because they do, uh, they do have a preference for skunk. Um, but they, you know, the male feeds the female the whole time she's on the nest. He might even take a short turn up to 30 days on eggs and then another 30 to 35 as, as fledglings. So they are out there ready to go. Um, so where I worked in Kentucky, I got there and the other apprentice had left and we had a, a blind great horned owl and we always use, you know, the thick leather gloves and, the gentleman before me, the young guy, I should say, probably out of college, he was holding the owl and something scared it audibly, really loud, made it made it jerk and it it clenched its talons. Now, great horned owls have 500 pounds of pressure per square inch in their grip. And what happened is he popped through the glove, through the guy's hand and back out again and was fine. It just was a, a grip and it let go. So he had gone to the doctor to get an x-ray to see if it broke one of the small you know, bones in the hand. And it turns out because of the pressure, it literally popped a hole. The tip of the talon popped a hole through the bone like a paper punch and never shattered the bone. And it just, all, all they could do is let it heal in. Um, so they're very large. They're, I've not heard of an attack by an owl, but I could see that happening with a great horn. If you mistakenly are too close to a nesting tree, I went hiking, uh, specifically looking for a nest one year, many years ago, and found the nest not that high up in a broken cottonwood. And then behind me, I heard the audible clicking of the beak, and they make this real loud, like, click with their beak. The females do and the male would if he was there this was the female she was quite large and i just slowly turned around and she was eyeing me and was mad i'm like yeah i need to get out of here because she was very very protective um there was another uh you know the the great horned owls have yellow eyes and so if you somebody says oh we found a brown eyed owl a big owl but he, and he has brown eyes it's a bard or a or a barn owl much easier to to handle and if they say it's a large owl with yellow eyes, then we know it's the great horned. And in Kentucky, we got a call. Now, remember, I'm just an apprentice right out of college. And somebody said, we caught a great horned owl in a box in our house. Can somebody come and get it? And we took off in the government station wagon and it went, we just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper into the Kentucky backwoods. And I got to tell you, it was, it, it felt like a bad movie and I was getting really uncomfortable. And there was this tiny light in the distance way down this little dirt, just kept getting a smaller road. And I don't know how my boss knew how to find it. And there was this tiny light and we went up and knocked on the door and this young boy was, was there and he goes, come on in, come on in. It's in the box. It's, it's got yellow eyes. And I'm like, Oh, I'm going to get the bigger gloves. If it's got yellow eyes and it's an owl, I'm going to get the bigger gloves. And I come back and he's waiting and I, and we open the box and there's just poor little Cooper's hawk on its back with bailing twine on its legs, on its feet. And I said, oh, I said, I said, this actually isn't a great horned owl. And as I was saying, but it's a, and he screams to this mysterious person in the back that we never saw. And he goes, see ma, I told you it was an eagle. <laughs> and she's screaming from there. Well, they don't need to stay any longer. They need to leave. And it was just crazy. And I said, I said, what's the bailing twine for? And he goes, well, you know, he's kind of feisty. So I just, I tied him to his legs and I just drug him home. It was horrible. And the bird did not live, um, but he, he thought he'd done something good for the bird. And, and in the end, it was a little too abusive, but so not knowing what it is um, can be a little bit, a little bit scary, confusing and, and otherwise. So um, let's see what we have. Let's see. We have some pictures. There's some. So 
there's one in flight and here's one in the center giving you the stink eye and they do have a nictating mem membrane so if you look here on the side this is getting ready to close and shut over that eye that nictating membrane is a goggle so if a rabbit or skunk something's kicking the the chance of it getting to the eye isn't as great uh, if that nictating membrane is there the crazy thing is you guys um I just turned when Jerry was talking and, and sharing some information and on my floor next to my desk, and I haven't seen this feather for a long time, but it was right on my floor. I kid you not. There's a great horned owl feather in my hand. Um, I will just for a second. It was kind of like, okay, this is just too weird. I've had a really odd week, but this feather was sitting on the floor and I don't even remember where I had it. And the coolest thing about owl feathers that I learned from a young girl who just paid more attention than I did, not only do owl feathers have, uh, their flight feathers will have a serrated edge to break the wind so they fly completely silently. You've probably heard that. Not only that, and they don't write about it, but the overall feather is fuzzy. Like if you put a hand lens to this, it looks downy. So if you pick up a feather and you're out looking around, you shouldn't keep it. Technically, I need to tell you it's illegal to keep any part of any bird that's because all of our birds minus the sparrow, the starling and the pigeon, all of them are protected by the federal government. But if you pick it up and look at it and you go, gosh, I wonder if it's a hawk or an owl, if it's fuzzy on the surface, that too helps break the sound of them in flight. And I didn't know that until maybe 10 years ago, but they are, they are very particularly fuzzy on top when you feel them. So if you find a feather you're not sure, or you know it's an owl, feel that fuzziness um, for me. Cause I think you'll find, especially if it's not attached to the great horned owl, right? It'd be safer. All right. So these guys clearly uh, can look a little ominous, but look at the, this next shot. This is, these are, these are pictures of the pictures in my camera from two years ago when COVID started, I could stand outside. I was working from home as we, most of us were, and I could stand outside my front breezeway door, point my camera at my neighbor's caddy corner. And that's who I saw those, those guys right there. Um, and now that that pair, which we think it's the same pair is back over there. And they used a red tailed hawk's nest from last year. Uh, last year, the owls nested um, one block to my west, and this is where they're at right now. So this is how um, they're starting to get their feathers on their wings, and they're starting to get a little more feathers coming out of the down. So what happens with owlets, and this is where we get into trouble, they will be branching and will often tumble to the ground. But once they're branching by choice, not by wind, and when they tumble to the ground, they'll hop around on the ground and they look completely um, in trouble. However, in order to fly with a body the size of this bird, they will then hop around and eventually go to the tree they came from and use their talons and their beak and pull themselves back up onto the branches. And that's really critical for the muscle development basically like where your scapulas are, same thing if you had wings, it's to build those neck muscles and those upper back muscles by pulling themselves up into the tree and they may flop again and do it again. Yes, you can be careful if you have dogs, something that might get them, walk your dog on a leash for a while if you've got them in your yard, but the key is they need to do that um, yes, they have fallen out of the nest when they are too little and need help. But right now, if they fall out of the nest now, they are doing what they are supposed to do. And you do not want to get near them or you may end up flogged or worse um, by mom or dad. So you want to be super careful. So the barred owl, the next one, the which we, I like to call the teddy bear owl, um, as you can see, breed at two years old. And we're looking at, you know, 30 days uh, on the incubation, two or three owlets are common. They, they take close to a month and a half. They're a little slow on the get-go to get out. Um, they do use old nests or cavities. We did do a study, 4-H put out a study and they put out uh, barred owl boxes with a roof and without a roof uh, to see what they preferred as we start to try to replace these nest boxes um, are to replace the loss of dead trees when people like to clean up dead trees and we got to get them if it's not going to fall on a building or a person please leave the dead trees uh, too many animals need them but sure enough the first year of course she didn't touch it this um, 
last year and this year, she chose the one with a roof. And I said, well, of course, what mom wouldn't choose a house with a roof, right? Uh, so I don't know that it's a good example of whether they'll take tree cavities that are solid or tree cavities that are broken open like, like our uh, great horns do. But we did it and she did choose the one with the roof. Uh, they, they like the woodland. I love woodland with water because they like to look for those crayfish. I said this already, hunts during the day, generalist. Um, they, don't, they don't go too far from home and they are considered a common, uh, common species at this time. So let's look and see. Um, there you go. So this is a bard. That's why we call her the, te the teddy bear. Look how deep those brown eyes are. Very sweet looking. The one owl that absolutely hated my guts in my apprenticeship was our barred owl. She only loved the man that was the naturalist. He was a Vietnam vet, had a big beard, and she was enamored with him. But she would do anything in her power to shred me. Um, so I look at this and people say, oh, she's beautiful. And I look at it and I see blood because um, the one I worked with, actually, I thought I was standing out of her range. I had a whole group of Elda Hostel on a bus tour. I'm giving my spiel. And she threw herself onto her breastbone, laid down, turned her head and pierced my ankle through my 1987 white sock. And um, as I was chatting, a lovely lady said, sweetheart, you're doing a great job, but you might want to go in real quick and, and take a look at that ankle. You're bleeding really badly. And I looked down and I was just, it was just blood red. I'm like, thank you. I'll be right back. <laughs> I went in and dealt with that. So yeah, she had, uh, she had quite the attitude and we went out calling. Um, one of the things I had to do, we did two van loads of people and we went out to call owls. It was an owl calling, you know, program. And we had a full 24 people on the two 12 passenger vans. I drove one of the vans, my boss drove the other. We get out in the pitch black of the Kentucky back, you know, woods and he goes, okay, try, you know, give a, give a barred owl call. And this is why today you will not hear me call them. I won't do it. I called, I did my best, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. And then we could hear some crunching. And I'm like, that's odd. You know, there's crunching in front of us in the pitch black. So I called again and there was a whole family of coyotes <laughs> with those junior coyotes about, you know, I don't know, end of, it was probably end of May, June. And every one of them lit up at the same time, just out of eyesight. And you've never seen 24 people load two vans faster than that moment. It was like when um, 13 line ground squirrels are all trying to go in the hole at the same time. And it was horrible. And I just stood there and my boss said, that's okay. We'll try again. I said, no, nope, that's it. I'm never calling owls for the general public <laughs> in my life. The coyotes don't bother me, but it sure scared the daylights out of all those people. So here's our barred owl project. This is the one with the roof that she's in again this year. And this picture I added is uh, Nest Watch. If you want to go uh, look at Cornell's website, you can go to allaboutbirds.org, but or just punch in nestwatch.org, and you can see where their barred owl is at this moment. I haven't had a chance to check, um, but it's also interesting to see what leftovers you can see if you're like me and kind of nerdy about you know what have they been bringing for her to eat um, because she is the the sole the sole sitter on the eggs there. So. Um, the nest watch is fun and you can see other, other they have different variety of birds that um, you can see nest cams with. So the barn owl, my, I have to say my favorite, Tito Alba, um, all continents except Antarctica, but yet it's endangered because of habitat loss. They like structures like barns, silos, um, and then an open field. So big trees that had whole, you know, broken holes and holes in them would have been nice. We don't have that anymore. Um, it would have been good for like the edge of a savanna near a meadow. Um, it's really about lack of voles and lack of lack of habitat. Um, quite a few eggs. They sit on, they fledge at around 54 days. So they're, they're in the nest and protected by a parent and quite a while. I will say their talons aren't near um, as large or scary. Um, the barn owl I worked with liked to sit on my head. So I always had tiny little scabs all the time, but nothing nothing horrible. Their scream, however, is incredible. If something scares them, it sounds like a woman screaming. Um, it's just, it's really incredible. And mine did it once that I worked with in my ear and dropped me to my knees. And I had a ringing in my ear for days um, and pain. I had to put cotton in it for quite a while. Um, it was, it was pretty bad. Um, they're very curious and they bob their head around a lot. 
So they, it's kind of bad because they're white and they, they bump, bounce a lot. And here's the one I work. Yes, that's me in the eighties. That's my best eighties <laughs> shot. I could, oh, that's terrible. Loved this bird so much. And I could open the door from the nature center every morning I got to work and I would look out if somebody already got him out and put him on his stand and they make the sound of a tire losing air. So it's just a pshh. And I'd go, hey, buddy. And he'd look over and he'd go, pshh. They'd bob up and down. And his favorite thing to do was to walk back to his mew. They call it a mew, which is where raptors sleep at night. He loved to walk on the ground past the, the, the flowers and look at the granddaddy long legs, the harvestman. And he would look at him and turn his head and look at me like, are you looking at these things? And he just had the most wonderful curiosity um very sweet i just i truly truly um truly love this animal very tiny talons not too scary so the eastern screech is our is our fourth out of our fab four megascops seo considered a species in decline part of this is going to be habitat those those nest trees we keep cutting down things because we think they don't look good they really prefer an opening what they really need is a woodpecker hole from maybe a red-bellied or a red-headed, um, pileated if you have them, and then a squirrel the next year to chew it bigger, and then a screech owl would love to have that home, right? So they're they're usually the third owner, and they need space, you guys, and we it's just it's hard. And then if you think about um, you know eating, you know we're dealing with a lot of a lot of pesticides and things that we have to keep their food safe and not not poison our rodents in our homes because if they get outside and they're full of poison it's going to poison these birds so we need to come up with other ways to uh, evict our rodent friends um death is you know they are the bottom of the food chain if and somebody said well you don't kill them do you i said yeah actually in the nature center i get so many i snap trap them but i lay them out out on the back uh for the animals they're gone then i know i'm not feeding them poisoned mice right and some people that's hard i understand that but we also have to care for our spaces and make sure we're not, I have little kids in here and I can't have an overabundance of, and it gets that way sometimes, you know, with the mice. So overabundance of waste is not healthy. Um, they do eat even large insects like big, big uh, grasshoppers. And they really knew those cavities. Um, they just have those little tufts. So they're like a mini me of the, of the uh, world. There's a gray. When I studied wildlife, we had gray, rufous, and brown. Rufous was red. Now they just say that it's gray and rufous. So things have changed a little bit. But look at those wicked little feathers. All those, all those, you know, horned owls like this and the great horn, the feathers, the satellite, the heart-shaped discs, the double binocular of the barred owl, those all are feathers that direct sound into their ears. They're, they're satellite dishes. And if you remember the toolbox, there was a satellite dish listed. That's their satellite dish. It's capturing sound so they, get, they can triangulate and find their food. These were um, <laughs> just because you built it. So I had an Eastern Screech uh, box, a nesting box, but I didn't expect to have Screech owls where I live. So my neighbor likes to kill my squirrels. I say my, cause he doesn't want them. And I love fox squirrels. Some of you are going, oh, not the squirrels. I do, you know, they, they are completely entertaining. They do feed our large predators, which we, you know they have to sustain that part of the food chain. So I put this screech owl box up so that the squirrels would nest in my yard and stay away from Mark's yard um, because he would shoot them. You know, granted he'd lay them out for the eagle or the hawks rather out in the field, but oh, it just killed me. So I put this box up and before the squirrels came in that um, December of 2019, the first thing I got was a Rufus screech owl. Couldn't believe my eyes. And it made it for the Christmas bird count. And then the, the squirrels ran out the, ran out the screech owl. And I was so mad at the squirrels. I'm like, wait a minute. I put the box up for the squirrels. I need to be happy with the squirrels. And that's, that was that year's little bunch of kids that were born in there. I know if you don't like squirrels, you're probably cringing, but you know what? Creation is amazing. And, and, I, uh, and I, I happen to like their shenanigans. Now the gray squirrels, we call those the devil's spawn, just so you know, they, they aren't near as sweet as the fox squirrels. So other than the fab four, these are the other owls we talked about. We have long-eared, short-eared that's real creative on the ornithology side isn't it northern sawwit which is tinier even than a screech owl and our snowy owl we'll go through those real quick 
So the long-eared owl, Osseo otis, nests in Minnesota, Dakotas, and further west. But we've had them and do have them in Sycamore, Illinois, where I live, and one was right on my street. And somebody saw it in the ditch and took a picture of it. Um, but it winters throughout. So that's what it was doing. It was moving around to find food. So they might, they look like, you're going to see it, they kind of look like like a skinnier great horned owl and sometimes have a real surprised look on their face, which I think is quite <laughs> comical. Um, they do not hunt during the day. That's just a protective thing. Um, both of the sexes court each other with wing flaps. Um, sometimes they're found in loose colonies. We call a colony of owls a parliament, quite particular, isn't it? Um, I will share with you my excitement. The first owls we had there at the beginning of COVID, I was having coffee in my coffee window prior. So this was in January of, the, of 2020. And I watched them, the male and female were just caterwauling in the back tree. I'm like, what are they doing? Well, they were courting, they were fluffing, and they actually copulated, this is an adult crowd, in my maple tree, in my backyard while I had coffee. I'm like, in all my life as a naturalist, it's those tiny moments. It's like, oh, I can't believe I witnessed. And then I got to see the results and watch them grow and fledge and branch and fall and tumble. So it was really, really, it just solidified my love of these birds. So here's the long, look at the right picture. This is a friend of mine and he got this picture in Sycamore. Can you, the surprise look, it just kills me. But if you look at the left one, that would be easy to mistake that for a great horned owl. But um, they, they're a little bit different in color fashion on their sides of their face. But had he not taken that picture, I would have thought that was doctored up because it just looks so wrong. But that is truly uh, your long-eared owl. Then there's the short-eared owl, the Osseoflamus, and winter's here, but um, there's a summer pod just over the, uh, the border in Wisconsin. So those come down and hang out. They like um, uh, the prairies and they like uh, pine trees in the prairie. So Afton Prairie here in DeKalb County is an example. We have a lot of pines that were planted, but a big open prairie. So we often get a, um, a small parliament of short ears. Um, they'll hunt during the day as well. And they hunt really low to the ground, really, really low to the ground. There is a gentleman who studies short eared and he is so enamored with them that he like camouflages up and lays in the grass of the prairies. I listened to him speak and he's um, researching all the short eared owls in different places in Illinois. And they, this hover drop pattern, really interesting. And they do, like, like I said, they will gather up and stay together. And here's, here's some pictures again, Ken. Mark is a, um, he's actually Joy O'Keefe, who's the bat specialist for extension and U of I. This is her husband. And he, he took some pictures and shared those um, uh, with, with some of the birds that were in our woodpecker show too. To the right is our rehabilitation, um, Kathy Stelford. She's been doing rehabilitation in the area for a long time. And this is out at Afton and it was kind of a good luck buddy, but the, you know, the crows see him right away, but, um, I'm hoping that one made, made it to safety from all the birds picking on it and found a way to find a, a, a parliament to join in order to go back. Look at the wing length on the left side. You know, you see the you know, when you saw those wing lengths, you're like, really, can they be that short and that wide? And it's true, the, the wings, they're, they're a slow flyer, um, but they can get a lot, of, a lot of air under those wings. The saw wit being the tiniest little beast, cute as can be, uh, winters in Illinois, it's the smallest, prefers a forest mixed, um, hard to find um, right here where I'm at. But if you wanna look for those, you're gonna look for a mixed forest of conifer and deciduous, and they do like cavities. Um, I have to giggle, the sawwit that was found in the New York City Christmas tree um, this last year, I think it was, um, they, they assumed that, um, that that bird was nesting in that tree. But you have, many of you have probably heard stories where they find great horned owls and different owls on semi-tractor trailers behind the cab, they hit the upper part of the truck and slide in behind and, and end up across the country um, or a hook to the front. So I had to giggle because they assumed the saw what was in the tree when the tree came down. I'm gonna guess that, that when that tree fell and they land, you know, laid it down, the bird would have left. I think they picked up that saw what in route, but what they did is they took it all the way back, states away to where the tree was. 
he could have been a couple, you know, who knows, half a state away or even closer. Who's to say where he got, but they took him all the way back. So I picture him completely confused. Um, and I do believe, I can't remember what they named it, but it turned out to be the opposite sex of what they chose. And here's a little Sawit um, mark and then one of them in captivity here on the right. You can see this one on the right had a bonk on the head probably. See how this eye is dilated? His right eye is more dilated. If they are blind or have a brain injury, the, the eye won't dilate correctly and match the other eye or they'll be fully dilated if they're blind um, and unable to see. So this one has an injury of some sort, but is being you know taken care of in, a, in an area where it is safe. The snowies comes down in the winter. You know, these... These uh, cornfields look like the tundra in the winter where I'm at, you know, DeKalb County is 81% agriculture still, and they hang out here in DeKalb County every winter, um, but they nest on the ground. But look at the fledge time, two weeks, that last list, two weeks. Well, of course, because they're on the ground, they are so at a disadvantage of survival by being on the ground. Um, so they're quick. They don't dilly dally and hang out in the nest long. Here's some good pictures uh, of here in DeKalb County. Uh, we get a lot of them. These are all three, I think, from probably from Ken. They're all DeKalb County birds, I think. Um, males, 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 males. Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, females. A lot of female pictures here. And then there, look at the one on the right, the male, how white they are. It's much whiter. I love, Ken got this one. I love this shot. And here's a nice female. Look at the thick feathering for, you know, when you capture prey and it bites back those feathers on legs uh, for these bigger owls are really important. Uh, we had a, an owl, uh, a, a snowy owl on the ground in DeKalb one year and Kathy Stelford, the woman that I showed you in the picture, she um, called me and she was not in town. She was in Iowa. And she said, how comfortable are you with, with owls? I said, I'm really comfortable, but like how comfortable? I'm like, very comfortable. What's, what do you need? It's almost Thanksgiving. You know, we're a couple of days from Thanksgiving. She goes, but like, are you comfortable with handling them? I said, I'm more comfortable with animals than people. What do you need? She goes, we've got a, a snowy owl on the ground in DeKalb. Somebody's picking it up, but my rehabilitator that's working is leaving and we need a day, you know, somebody to watch it, you know, take it for the day till I can get another rehabilitator out to get it uh, on Thanksgiving. I said, yeah, we can do that. So we got a crate delivery of a, a snowy owl and she was um, actually her bill was split. So she was having trouble getting enough food, but they had she uh, the lady that was leaving town chopped up raw chicken bones and all gave me this bowl of chicken and some big forceps and said just feed her chicken as much as she'll eat, you know, and then let her rest and keep her in the crate blah blah blah. So my son and I sat down on the floor in our breezeway and I opened the thing. They're not afraid of people because they don't see people. They're not, you know, super intimidated and they're not aggressive. So I'm sitting there holding this bowl of chicken parts and I hand put it in there and she's clicking a little bit because she's a little nervous being in the box and I'm feeding her. And I look down at the bowl and I had like fleece pajama pants on. I was going to go to bed soon. And she hopped out of the kennel and put both of those feet on my calf and, and wanted more food. And my son looked at me, goes, this isn't good, is it? I said, do not make a sudden move. Do not breathe heavy. Let's just see how this goes. So I fed her and was just like, oh my gosh, this is going to hurt. She never tightened up other than to keep her balance on my leg. And when, when she was full, she gave me kind of a click, click with her beak and then hopped off my leg and went back in the box. I was sweating because I can't imagine how deep those talons would have gone into my calf, but it was also a highlight, of course, um, no scars to show off like some of my other ones, but you know, it was pretty cool to have that, that happen and happen with my son right there. So we'll finish up with some, uh, things, how to find them and some, uh, examples of them. Uh, now, you know, to, you know, we got to know their habitat. What are they after? You know, your great horned owls, they need big trees. Um, be there at twilight or dawn, so that action. So when the owls were living a block from my house in the morning at, during the blue hour, you know, before the daylight, we have a blue hour in the morning and the night. I love the blue hour for coffee time. 
And every morning, the male owl would come across the back of my fence with something in his talons to take to the nest a block away last year. And then the hawks would come off the nest where the owls are this year, come over the top of the house and head to the radio tower to go watch. It was the coolest shift change of the world of ecosystem and, and uh, I just enjoyed it. So uric acid, you know, when they go to the bathroom, it's very white, that uric acid stains and, and you'll see it on a roost, on the ground, on trees. If you see a lot of that, it could be a heron if you're by water, a little small rookery, but you always wanna, if you see a lot of white uric acid, you've got a big bird, it's good to look up. <laughs> Maybe step a ways back and then look up. Pellets on the ground, maybe a potential tree. Um, sometimes they just throw them up from a standing on a branch, but a lot of times from their roost, they'll, they'll send up those pellets. Um, and you'll see those parts and pieces. Um, here's, this one was one getting ready, the middle one was getting ready to throw up a good size pellet. It's not pretty. The uric acid, this is a picture my son took in Argentina when they were doing some tours, he saw a barn owl and recognized it and they, they evidently roost there all the time, the uric acid. And the far right is a uh, great horned owl pellet I found in a quarry uh, up in Boone County. And I've left it whole just to show people, but I have another one that I have all the bones out of that was in my yard. And there's the one on the left um, that was in my yard. Uh, I took it all apart, some good size bones and um, different, different, they're different animals. There's a couple different animals in there. And I, I keyed them out at one point and I think we had a baby raccoon or possum and then uh, some rodent parts and pieces. And then this is a jaw that was in there. Um, uh, in that pile. It's a two inch. Can you imagine throwing up a two inch bone that size? And that's not a big deal. Um, so what is the deciding factor? Well, the absolute deciding factor is habitat. These animals need a specific habitat. They need protection and they need food on that habitat. So it has to be healthy and, and, and well-developed. Um, they need these things. You know, if we mow less, I actually, um, I've been buying all my plants, um, almost all of them exclusively from wild ones each year. And I'm slowly changing my yard over to as native as possible. But, you know, I never tell people they have to change everything all at once. But I left an area full of grass, just the European junk that's in my yard. And I mowed trails. And I, and somebody said, why are you doing that? I said, I'm trying to keep a family of hawks alive and a family of owls alive. And sure enough, it's hard for the hawks to hunt my little grassy space because of the tightness with the fence in the, you know, about a quarter acre fenced in, but I've seen the owl watching for the voles and it is full of voles. Yes, it's close to my house, but you know what? I've yet to have a vole in the house because it's like a buffet restaurant for the local birds. And I'm happy with that. I'm super happy. But now I want to, I want to grow something slightly more native or less of the European stuff that's gonna seed out um, and replace it with something else that sedges, anything that'll make the voles interested. Um, I, we talked about no poisons, we're talking about, of course, you know, natives, all my plants from the wild ones, oh my gosh. And I'm not just saying this, it's, they all are so healthy. I have a hepatica I got last year on the la at the last second that never got in the ground. It bloomed all winter in my breezeway and I know it's probably bad for it. And I'm like, oh, it didn't get to winter over. Now it's putting up fresh leaves. And that's, it's insane how healthy they are. So thank you to all of you for that. So here's a quick example. I didn't put which bird, doesn't matter. Go to, go to Cornell, they're the hot spot for all this. If you want to draw a certain bird and you think you have a certain owl and you think you have the right habitat nearby, you have to consider a lot of things. They're the habitat first, where to attach the box, you know, what, what they need, and then when are they gonna be there, right? When are they gonna actually be there? If you just put in nestwatch.org and then put in birdhouses, you'll find it. Um, they have a great site. And then in that site, you're gonna see, depending on the bird, they're gonna tell you how, what the height range, this matters. They have a particular need. What's the spacing between boxes? You don't want two great horned owls. If you have one pair for a very large space, that's okay. Which way should you face it? How early are they nesting? You know, do they need the heat from the southern sun or are they nesting late and you don't want to be facing the southern sun more east? Measurements, the whole size matters, the depth matters, and the width and length matter. So don't just put up a box with a hole they actually have specific needs and you can find that on uh, the Cornell website. 
So um, as I tell you um, about this program, I, I would ask that, you know, instead of doing a, an evaluation, you consider buying plants and planting natives because natives are going to draw insects and insects are, you know, animals like shrews that eat insects, thick plantings draw voles and things that feed them. Um, and maybe consider something you learned and share it with people about owls. Consider an action you could take, maybe not cutting something down or sharing that if the tree's not gonna crush a building, a fence or a human, convince your neighbors to um, save some of this habitat. Um, I would ask that of you today for the sake of these birds, because we are just starting to see things starting to change for them. That is gonna be, you know, like the barn owl. It's a, it's a real serious problem and they're, they're just too beautiful to lose. So thank you very much. I'm not been watching. Uh, doesn't look like the chat has questions, but if you have questions, um, the group isn't huge. It's up to you guys um, on the team to decide if you want them to type them in or just ask. Um, if I know the answer, I will tell you. If I don't, I will tell you I don't. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so uh, you can... Uh, type a chat a question in the chat, or you can just unmute yourself and um, and ask it. We'll, we'll take a couple minutes to do that. Yeah, Paul yeah, put something in the chat box. You got a question in there about have you heard about avian bird flu coming this way? Oh yes, we've been hearing about this. As a matter of fact, people thought I was crazy a month ago when I bought enough chicken to grill for the next you know two months. Um, before they put limits on it because it's it, yeah the bird flu is kind of the the bird the, the covid for the birds um and so we were talking about this before the presentation and i was asked my opinion today about what to do about bird feeding and you can do anything you want it's your bird feeders it's your yard but i am recommending that you just end feeding wash those up, do a light ble bleach wash. I use a five gallon bucket and just pack them away. There's, there's insects out now. Um, there's the, the birds, we, we feed birds for us and they can survive without us. I know that hurts our feelings, but you know, the USDA is saying, if you have backyard chickens, you should quit feeding. But if that's the case, I don't, I don't raise chickens, but I love my, my songbirds. So, and it's migration season, you guys, they're going to be bringing that to your, you know, to your bird baths and to your feeders. And I, my personal choice is that everyone would, you know, just curtail feeding for this year um, and try mm -hmm. to not let that take because our birds are flock birds right they they you know look at our goldfinches if you have if you think you have 10 goldfinches you probably have 100 you know and and you get if that gets in there you're going to lose them all and um so just something to consider it's your own choice though any other questions that's a good question Hey Peggy, it's Janet. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, I noticed that the um, snowy owl, the male, was very light in color, and I believe the uh, barn owl male is quite light in color. Mm -hmm. Is that typical? Do you think of all the owls where the male tends to be lighter, or is it just well, those two species? The, the great horn look almost identical, except the female's huge. You know, if you see a, if you see a great horned owl and you're like, man, that is a big owl. Chances are it's the female. Um, it's just, it's a morph, you know, it's, it's a, for the, for the snowy owls, I look at it more like they'd both be light, but she has to sit on the ground. Um, the barn owls in the tree, you know, or in a, uh -huh. uh, rather in a building by preference. Um, and so it might just be a color pattern, but those patterns can change. You know, you look at, a lot of our birds of prey, except for eagles, you know, who, you know, are bald eagles, white head, white tail, that never changes mm -hmm. unless they're, you know, um, having some uh, leucism. Uh, but I don't know, you know, I just know that that female better be speckled if she's going to be able to protect those, those eggs. And then sure. for two weeks have, you know, owlets under her. Um, and those change, you know, natural selection isn't something that can happen overnight. So the losses, you know, you lose, you lose enough owlets because the female's too light over time you get a female the females become very speckled right very fledged so the male didn't have that happen the male doesn't have to hide 
because he's up somewhere out of the way. He's not sitting there with her. Um, so there may be those changes happening over decades. Okay. Peggy, um, when do the barn owls nest? Because I've closed up my barn for the winter. Um, I'd love to have one come in. You know, they're, they're later than, so they, in my mind, and I would have to double check this, but they take a long time to, to fledge. They're going to be right, right in or after their food is there. So voles are one of their primary diet. Their food's here all the time. It's a matter of competition, but they aren't going to need, they lay more eggs, but they're smaller animals. They're sharing a vole goes a long way. Whereas a great horn is going to swallow a vole whole. So they're going to come, I would guess they're going to come in right about the same time as the bard or just in the middle, you know, middle of the bard time frame. So, you know, they may, they're probably sitting on, they could be on eggs now, you know, but I, I feel like they go a little bit more into a little bit warmer season and they're kind of just, I'm surprised, you know, if they didn't have a habitat issue, they'd be fine because their, their egg numbers are like what, five to seven eggs um, and their success rate if they had the habitat and look at the rodent population i mean they they're not looking for food that's sparse so um i would say that you know if you if you had a barn that you had an opportunity to put a shelf in a window a broken glass window or something now um you might be a little late but for next year and you want it to season you don't want it to look brand new they're kind of picky probably but um if you have an old barn and you're willing to have a hole in a window or just take out a window and put a box in there um, look up on that Cornell, what they want for shape and size. They may okay. just want a platform. I think they like just having something with a little bit of an edge. Um, but they're, you know, all birds want a certain thing. So you have to kind of cater to that. Well, thank you. I think that's yeah. very informative as usual. And we love all your stories. Yeah. yeah. Keeps it, keeps it moving a little bit than just wah, 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 wah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Again, if, uh, if any of you have not volunteered already for the native plant sale, this is our big activity and we uh, need volunteers and uh, contact uh, Kim, uh, Loman Vo uh, Vomer or um, Janet or I. We especially need people on um, Friday, May 6th from five to seven and on May 7th from 11 to three. So tomorrow's your deadline for getting in orders. Uh, and you can email the order, a uh, copy of the order form into uh, Janet and use PayPal and you'll be okay. 